In a recent series of seminars on demystifying boardroom dynamics, Ms. Pooja Shukla, senior lecturer in the Li Shao Ki School of Business and Administration at the Open University of Hong Kong, analyzed board succession planning in today's business environment, noting how succession planning involves the management of the board of directors' skill sets or talents. In this seminar, Ms. Shukla discusses not only the importance and challenges of succession, but also the modern approaches to succession planning. Today we are going to discuss board talent management. In very simple words, board means the board of directors. Talent means the skill set that the board of directors have. And management means managing the skill set of all the people on the board and everything that the company needs in terms of their industrial experience, their technical experience and the soft skills. Talking of succession planning, succession planning means looking out for your new successor. The latest example I can give you is um, the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe recently has communicated that he wants to resign because of his persistent health issues. He is 65 years of age. Now, Japan has a problem. Japan has to find someone with no prior experience of running a country like Japan. Someone who can successfully become the right next person and take it to the next level. Very kindly, Shinzo Abe has agreed that to make the transition smooth, he would assist throughout the process, wherein he would be with the new person in the office for a few months where he would train and teach him all the uh, tips and the tricks of the business and how to run the economy and the whole country. So today we are going to discuss just like how it is important for a country to find its new successor, how it is even more important for companies because the failure rate is very high because a lot of your money is at stake and which is your own money. First of all, before I begin, what is talent? What do you think is talent? You see dancers on the stage with perfect dance moves, with very symmetrical moves and body angles, and you say, oh, that is talent. Or you're watching your favorite movie and you say, wow, perfect editing, perfect dialogues. That is talent. So is talent fixed? That is, either you are talented or you are not talented. Do you think you can get, you can achieve, you can become talented? I'm sure you also already know the proverb, practice makes a man perfect. So if you are not talented in a particular field of, of study or business or anything that you want to be talented in, you have to practice. So the answer is yes, talent can be earned. Now, I got these two very interesting sentences to confuse you. How are you talented versus how talented are you? The first question talks of what kind of skill set you already have. And in the second part, we discuss, okay, you have the skill set, but what, are, what is your specialization in terms of the skill set that you already have? I'm going to trick you again. What is the difference between talent and genius? Talent is something, is doing easily something which others find difficult. Whereas genius is easily doing something that others find impossible. I hope you like it. So now all of you would be wondering if you can be a director. I know all of you are very young people in studying and undergraduate students or postgraduate students. 
So can you be a director? The answer is yes. If you are above 18 years of age and are not disqualified under the law, which means you are not an undischarged bankrupt or you have not committed any kind of fraud or any kind of persistent breaches with the company's ordinance and, and all other subsidiary ordinances. Now let us discuss the types of directors, executive and non-executive. If you are a student of corporate governance or business or finance, I don't have to explain it to you, but just to remind you to polish your memory. In very simple words, executive and non-executive means people who are insiders and outsiders. So executive director is someone who is an inside director within the company, someone who is an employee, someone who gets normal salary as an employee is an executive director who looks after day-to-day -day working of the company. Non-executive director is an outsider who is not an employee of the company, who is there only to provide mentorship, guidance to the company. Now, I want to talk about the functioning of succession planning. For that, you need to know what is the meaning of old boys network. Okay, so let's say you, you move to a new city or a neighborhood and you want um, a babysitter. What do you do? I am sure that for a babysitter, you would simply not Google because you need someone you can trust, right? You are someone you can trust um, in terms of your family, someone who are, you are going to give your baby to, someone who is going to be in the house while you are away. So what do you do? You generally ask for recommendations. You ask your friends, your, your, your relatives or your colleagues for recommendations. Why? because it is easier to trust when someone is coming with a recommendation. Whereas Google can help, but not when you need to build that trust. Similarly, when you are a director of a big company, let's say, let ta let's take my example. Imagine I've, if I am a very rich person, I am maybe around 60 years of age and I run a multi-million dollar company in Hong Kong. Where do you think my network is building? I go out for drinks. I go out and I play golf. I go out with my other senior management people and I know them. I see and meet other people, let's say uh, business chambers and I have a small network there where other people from similar background who also run multi-million dollar companies are also coming and we meet and I know them at a level where I um, can kind of trust them or I know them or I know their capabilities. I maybe know, I have been maybe drinking with them maybe for the last 20 years. So I definitely have that kind of trust factor, factor with them. This is how old boys network gets built and how it works. So if in my listed company, if I am looking for a director of operations or a director of finance, my first call would be someone I met already, maybe in my chamber of commerce, maybe in, my, in the bar that I regularly go to, where I know the person and I trust him enough to come to my company, become the director, not mess it up, not change, not try to change the ways my company has been functioning overnight. Someone who can provide me constructive feedback, someone I can trust, whose capabilities I already know. Even maybe I can vouch for their capabilities. So this is how old boys network works. And um, even if you know, I do not know how much you know about Indian culture, a very interesting example. I'm sure you know uh, how the uh, arranged Indian, Indian marriages work. So there is a particular class in India which where you have the super rich people, 
um, the people who work in the cinema, people who work, uh, have run the big listed companies, when they have to uh, get their uh, sons and daughters married, you know, they compare what kind of net worth they want to have when they want to send in their daughters to some other house or when they want to uh, have a bride or a groom. So this is how this kind of network builds in. Builds in. You set your criteria and then you go out and reach to, to your required network. Now let us discuss the traditional and the modern approach of succession planning. Let's talk about the companies now and the companies 50 years ago. Do you think there is any kind of similarity? Maybe yes, but mostly no. The work, the business environment, everything has changed so much that it is difficult to stay and stick with the same techniques that we had been using 50 years ago or even 20 years ago or probably I can say 10 years ago. The business environment and the workforce has been changing every day. Similarly, we are changing our techniques to find out the new successor whom we can trust, who can build the empire for us. War for talent. War for talent means the continuous um, uh, race where you want to retain the leadership that you have in your, country, in, your, in your company and also you want to remunerate them enough that they do not go to a competitor. For example, let's say if I have an um, accountant working in my company and I pay him say $50,000. What if my competitor comes in and he says okay, uh, how about I pay you $60,000? And just with a little bit of um, extra cash, if my accountant decides to leave my company and forgets about all the training, all the on-the-job training I provided him, and the kind of loyalty and the, and the trust building and the, you know, when you work for a company, you feel like a family. And if the accountant decides to leave me, my company, just for the sake of extra $10,000 to go in a new environment, this, if you ask me, or if you ask your parents, they would tell you that they used to stick to one company for, for their lifetimes because they were loyal, because they trusted their employer. But with the change in the workforce, now things have changed. Right now, it is simply about who gives more, who pays more, who gives what in what way. So the war for talent has also changed the succession planning. The new methods have come in to attract and develop and retain the leaders. You know how bonuses are paid, you know how, about how the directors are issued the sweat equity shares. You also know uh, during appraisals, um, wh wh what kind of stars do you get? They can, they can severely affect how you get paid. Now let us discuss the most important question here. Has the old boys network dismantled everything that I told you about the big directors visiting the golf members or people who are at their, uh, the, the drinking party, the drinking team. Is it all waste now? What do you think? The answer is yes and no. Because the network has merely shifted. Earlier, there used to be directors within directors who would appoint each other. But now, because the new workforce, the modern changes have been uh, have been imbibed so much into the culture that companies think that if they invite the recruitment firms it looks fancier, it looks good on the annual reports and also the kind of the uh, appraisal, the, the SWOT analysis that they do for the uh, candidates, it looks very good on the paper. So yes, the network has shifted, yes and no. This time we are discussing the era of social media where everyone knows a lot of people, where people do not have to actually go to someone and ask for their email ID or phone number. You already have that 
thanks to the internet and you can get connected there. You can talk to people about business, about a lot of other things. Now let us discuss the difference between connections and contacts and how does it work. In my LinkedIn account, I have more than 3000 connections. That does not mean that I have met all of them. That does not mean I personally know even 10% of them. But that means that I know all the people that I need to know. And I'm, this is how I am expanding my network. Most of the people in my network are either lawyers or company secretaries or directors. If you ask me if I know anyone as a professor of quantum physics, uh, maybe no. So this is how your connections and contacts work. If I have a uh, vacancy where I'm looking for a lawyer on cybersecurity, instead of simply uh, googling that stuff, I might reach out to an, a connection in my LinkedIn contact where we have been connected maybe a few months ago, but that kind of trust is there because that person is in my contacts and I can immediately reach out to that person and ask for help. And this is how connections become contacts when you start meeting persons in person, when you kind of start a relationship, even if it is a business relationship, then your connections become contacts. And further, succession planning is, as a process, is get, gets more personalized. Now let us discuss the role of a nomination committee. So every listed company in Hong Kong and a lot of other places is required to have a nomination committee in their company. The members of the nomination committee are mostly board of directors and the exchange expects you that majority of the members of this committee are independent directors. So what is the role of this nomination committee? Why do, we, why do we need a nomination committee? The role of the committee is to review the structure and size and composition of the board to see what kind of skill set we already have on board, what is missing, what, is, what needs to be managed. Their role is to identify the members who can become the board members after the present members retire or resign. And succession planning is, is the biggest agenda item for the nomination committee because they are responsible to select the next person who is going to become a part of their team. Now let us discuss the most, most important topic of this discussion. Even if you have not learned anything until now, I want you to pay attention. Let us discuss the difference between succession planning for CEO and director and why it is important. So, I'm sure all of you know what is the role of a CEO. And I know you know what is the role of a director. So CEO, in very, in very brief terms, is a person who controls, manages your whole company. Someone who is responsible as one person taking care of everything about the company, who leads the decision making, who is the first port of call when it comes to problem solving, when it comes to uh, selection or any other matter. So the CEO, because it is just one person, has to play the role of becoming the person who takes up the blame if the company defaults, who takes up the um, courage to, 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 to make all the um, uh, changes in the organization, who decides who sits where, what goes where. And since CEO is going to manage your business, you cannot simply pick one person from your golf club or from your uh, drinking team to become the CEO because your CEO must have the specific industrial experience that your company is in. So if you are a, an IT company, you cannot simply 
give the reins of your business to a person who has no IT experience? Maybe, yes, you can. That's going to be a revolution, revolutionary move. But I have to remind you that it can, it's very risky. So generally, most of the companies, I would say 99.999% of the companies look for a CEO with a prior industrial experience. Now let us discuss the succession planning for directors. When it comes to directors, you have a team of between four to 10 people on your board where you have different kinds of skill set. A director may have the same industrial experience, may not have the same ex in industrial experience. Whereas for CEO, you definitely need to see th that kind of industrial experience. I hope this is clear now. I've got this data for you. It is from the uh, companies in US and Canada. And it says that finance is the number one most desired skill. And this is not just because finance is important. Yes, finance is important. But I want to remind you that most of the exchanges, stock exchanges, have this requirement that you must have at least one person with finance and accounting experience sitting on your board. So this is why this data shows finance as the most desired result. The second one is the legal and governance. So all other skills that you see are the skills that directors, it was the decision by the director and not a mandate by the stock exchange to have that skill on the board. Most of the directors uh, of, of big listed companies feel that a prior experience as a director is a must for you to become a director in their company. I do not know how many of you agree with that or not, but imagine if this becomes the norm, the new generation would never get a chance to become directors unless they become directors of their own companies. So, so this kind of um, norm is creating issues in terms of availability of the talent from where the board of directors of listed companies can choose from. So this is another hurdle in terms of succession planning because the pool is, is, is decreasing and decreasing. Now I'm going to show you the example of how um, companies who are trying to um, appoint new directors prepare a skill matrix to see what kind of skill set they need in their company and to also see what kind of skill is missing in their skill set and how they can compensate, how they can appoint people who have both or someone who, who, who can bring in um, a talent which is absolutely missing from the board. So this is how generally we prepare the matrix where you count experience of general management and business operations, prior experience as a CEO, CFO, technology, finance, risk, accounting, mergers and acquisition, legal and regulatory, corporate governance. But you have to keep in mind that the industry where your company is operating majorly decides which stream of business, which stream of talent you want in your company. For example, if you are a company into marketing, you definitely need someone from the marketing background. If you are a company uh, which is a service provider of, let's say, if you're an audit firm, you definitely need people from finance background, from legal background, from corporate governance background on your board. I hope you understand that every company is different Every company has different needs. So this kind of skill matrix is not applicable for everyone. One size fits all approach, no. Now let us discuss the life cycle of a director. You get recruited, then we provide you induction, which means we provide you all the information about the company, about your role, the expectations of the company from you, 
Then we provide you learning and development based upon your skill set and your training requirements. Then we do performance management, which means we assess the skills that you have, we evaluate your performances. And the last stage is succession, where you retire and you pass on the throne to the next rightful person. Now let us discuss briefly the steps to board performance management. First is measurement, you measure your skills, your performance. Second is assessment, you evaluate your role, your achievements. Next, we do development to see where you are lacking and we provide you training on, the, on those areas. And finally, remuneration, we award, we reward your performance. Board learning and development. There is a very interesting model uh, by Charles Jennings, it's called 70-20-10. Uh, and I want you to remember this because you can use this model in a lot of um, your uh, answers with whichever stream of business you are in. So this model says that 10% of your learning comes from a proper classroom environment, from proper lessons and, and formal classes. 20% of your learning comes from the communication with your peer group, any kind of discussions that you discuss with people or friends or people in your company. And this is where the role of the chairperson comes in. It is your chairman or chairwoman who can train you, who can guide you as to how to go about your company, how to improve upon your skills, which areas to focus on while working in the company. The second most important person is the company secretary who knows in and out of the company, who knows the board's behavior, who is the right person. There's a difference between good and right. So the company secretary knows that even if you are good, but you must be the right candidate and how you can improve upon your skills. So the 70% of your learning, be ready for it, comes from working on the job which means when you start working, when you become a director or you, become, you start working in any company. So most of, the, most of your learning comes from the business environment where you work in. So life is the biggest university. Now let us discuss why do we need succession planning? Corporate changes, there, is, there are no two days which are same, I'm sure. Even in your personal life, you would have experienced that. Imagine when you extrapolate that for a corporate day for a company. New day, new challenges. The aging board members, as you know that most of the directors uh, have to prove themselves with years and years of experience before they get a chance to become a board member. So most of the board members are generally slightly older than the average age in a company. Next is shortage of talent. Like I discussed, new people are not given a chance to become the directors. So it is the dwindling population of the directors which is available everywhere in the world, not just Hong Kong, everywhere else. Then you have skill gaps and training needs. Even if you have someone in your mind who can rightfully become the next successor of your chairman, but what if there are a few areas that you realize are missing? So you need to provide proper training to that person to become the rightful successor. Let us discuss the factors to consider while succession planning. Organizational life cycle, in whichever stage of organizational life cycle you are at, your requirements are different. Maybe you need someone with a high speed who can work day and night, with, who can take uh, decisions at a blink of an eye. Or maybe you are at a stage where you need someone very wise, someone very much more balanced, someone much more um, thoughtful of what lies in the future. Someone who takes a step back to think, ah, oh, I'm not sure if this is the right decision. So that depends upon your life cycle. The transition time per candidate. So what happens sometimes a candidate is a quick learner. Sometimes a candidate is a quick learner, but there are so many other factors, uh, complex organizations, or the company is going through a challenging situation. 
where you need to provide a lot of handholding to the newcomer. So the transition timeline is different in terms of every candidate and every company also. The intersection point of job design and skill set. So every job design and every skill set, if they are exactly the same, I would say it's like the Cinderella and the shoe. But that does not exist, right? Everywhere, either you need to tweak your job design or you need to tweak the skill set. It is very difficult to find person exactly how you dreamed of. Standards, policies, methods and metrics of every organization are different. That's why you need to consider what type of person is fit for you. Since every company have quality assurances or other policies in place, so you need to align your new succession plan to see where the new person fits in, what kind of plan you need to arrange, whether it is available uh, or not. And company practices, like I said, no two companies are same, just like no two persons are same. So you would think that, okay, Pooja, you have convinced me that every company needs to have a succession plan. But the question is, not every company has a succession plan. Why not? We just realized how important it is. We just realized the case of Japan. We realized, oh wow, it is so important. Suddenly it can make or mar your future, your, your business. Then why companies don't have it? Because it's hard. It's hard to draft it. Like I explained, the priority is given to CEO succession planning more than it is given to a director's succession planning. There is a low uh, turnover in terms of directors. So let's say you have an average of 10 directors on your board and one director is going to retire every three to five years, which means you have a lot of sweet time to think and plan. But what we do not plan is the contingency situations that can come in. There are a lot of issues in finding a director with general and specific business experience. Like I explained that you can find people who have been directors in, in other countries or other companies uh, or CEOs, but do they have the specific business experience of running your company? Maybe you are a startup. Maybe you are a listed company going through a very bad time. Or even now, for example, because of the pandemic, the situations are everywhere are very bad. So the directors who have the experience of dealing with such kind of crisis management are becoming the most desired uh, people when it comes to succession planning. Unavailability of skills, like I explained, newbies are not given chances. So it's again the same pool of directors who, who keep on hopping from one company to the other. Now let us discuss the problems in succession planning. First is resistance to change. The companies have been managing themselves in a particular way. If suddenly a new person, let's say a new CEO comes on the first of the month, and he realizes, this is not right, I do not want this department, I want this and this, this department to be combined. I do not want people to have two hours of lunch break, I do not want this. What happens then? Suddenly, you feel, this is not right. I have been working this way for the last 20 years in my company and no one questioned me. Why you new person questioning my um, behavior? You don't, know, you don't know how to do my job. So there is a lot of resistance. Lack of support by the persons of influence. If I am the CEO and I, let's say I am 75 years of age and my company has, has decided to, to look for a successor, there is going to be a lot of resistance from my side because you are looking for my replacement in a company where I have worked for a, for a long time. So this is how the senior management also, who has been working with me, they are so loyal to me because we have worked as a team. And suddenly, one of the team members is going to um, get out and a new member is going to come in. How is that going to affect my position? How, how much of insecurity feeling is going to bring that into me and my organization? Silos and turf wars. 
I'm sure all of you have seen a lot of movies where uh, rival groups fight each other for powers. And this also happens in companies. I have a lot of funny examples where I have seen uh, the finance department controlling the budgets and the legal department controlling the approvals of transactions and how they fight with each other. And ultimately, it's the company that suffers when the transaction does not get approved. It's a loss of the company. Lack of time. Everyone is busy. Do not disturb me. I'm busy working on this transaction. I will think about it later. And that later never comes. Not being realistic. People are looking for CEOs who have all the qualities like a god. But you cannot find everything in just one candidate. You have to be realistic. You have, if you have industrial experience, you might have to compromise maybe on some other skill set. Now let us discuss the steps towards successful succession planning. Look at your entire company and you need to know who you are as a company so that you know who is the rightful next successor. There is a difference between a good candidate and a right candidate. A good candidate might not be right for you. Someone who looks great on paper might not be actually good for your company because maybe your company is very, has a culture of um, a lot of, um, uh, let's say you are a flat organization and you are looking for a candidate who is coming from a, from a company which has completely opposite style of working, even though the candidate is perfect, but he's not right for you because the soft skills, the cultural and digital intelligence maybe is missing. So you have to look for a right candidate. Identify your rock stars and your rock bottom stars. When you do your appraisals, you can see who are the most um, highest performing candidates and who are the candidates who may create problems for you in the future. Understand that the growth does not have to be upward, which means the growth can be laterally advancing too. So people who have not been able to perform, let's say in one department, how about you transfer them to another department and see if they can work there. If you read the news regularly, you would see a lot of examples where people have been like really underperforming and when they were transferred to another department, they grew manifold and they up to the level of becoming the CEOs of the company. So you have to look at your workforce from every single, uh, not just 3D or I would say probably 50D, uh, 50 dimensional uh, uh, environment plan for diversity. I cannot stop talking of, about diversity. I really want to do maybe another talk on diversity and its benefits, but I'm sure that as students you have definitely all the information as to how diversity brings in all the good changes and improves performances. There is a lot of data to support that companies which have diverse board of directors are able to perform better and in terms of just not just profitability but also brand. To conclude, succession planning is an iterative process, which means it's not just continuous, but each time you continue with it, you have to be ready with new set of circumstances, which will change your entire process. Succession planning is not a tick on the box where you say, okay, it is January 2020, we have discussed succession planning, We'll discuss that in 2021 now. No, it has to be a multi-year review because a lot of circumstances change. Your people are changing, your environment is changing, your company is continuously changing. Last but not the least, succession planning has to be evolutionary and not revolutionary. You cannot change the whole company in one day unless it is for the good. I hope you learned something new from my seminar and I thank you for all the time that you have given to me and uh, I'm sure that has, this has changed your perspective about how companies work 
and how succession planning is important. Thank you.